or did he do it? Would you spend your spare time hundreds of feet underground in dark and narrow passageways, some of them entirely filled with water? It's not everybody's idea of a good time, it's certainly not mine. But for the nearly 10,000 regular cavers in this country, it opens up a new world to be explored, a world where new caverns and passageways can still be discovered. But if something goes wrong, it's up to the cave rescue teams, all of them manned by volunteers, to get you out. Beneath the hills round Matlock Bath in Derbyshire is a network of caves, once mined for their minerals. They're abandoned now. Some of them still pose a challenge for experienced cavers. Others, like Dido's cave, are easy to get into and popular with beginners. It was there that a local group of Boy Scouts went for their first taste of caving. If boys are going to have an adventurous activity, you can't totally remove any element of risk because that then removes the adventure. But you do have to judge what risk you are going to expose them to very, very carefully. OK, boys, can you make sure you keep your torches on all the time? If you get into any difficulties, wait where you are, and one of the leaders will come and help you and sort you out. Now, if you go in with Lou leading off, the events that were to take place here were so extraordinary that 11 years later, Philip Gregory, who's being played here by an actor, and the men who went to his rescue can still remember almost every detail. The scouts were heading down towards the lake in the main cavern, 250 feet into the hillside. That's up there as well. I wouldn't like sleep in it. OK, boys, we have a bit of quiet. It's time we were moving out. We've got two choices. You can either go up to the top there, where there's a leader at the top, or you can come down. Uh, if you look just there, there's a little sump. If you just duck under it, there's a way out the other side. It's only a very short one. You just got to duck under the surface and straight out the other side. A number of the scouts wanted to go through a little sump at the end. One of the leaders went through there first and then shone a torch back so that there was some sort of light shining. Deep breath, down you go. Well done, Graham. Well done. Up, up, out of the cave and get dry. Come on then, Philip. Right. Deep breath, down and through out the other side. OK? Yep. Down you go, then. Deep breath, down and through and out the other side. OK. Down you go. Right. Well done, Lister. Are you the last? Uh, yeah, I think so, yeah. Good, right. Up there and out as quick as you can. Get dry. Yeah. <laughs> 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 we all enjoyed that. Yeah. Get yourself dry quickly. Before we do anything else, can we just check how many we've got? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, Where's nine. Phil? I've got his torch. Who? Phil Gregory? Yeah. You sure he's not here? No. As soon as we found out one was missing, we went straight away back to the cave, checked through it, uh, checked along the river bank uh, to see if he'd been mislaid there at all. And obviously, uh, once we'd done that initial check, we were extre extremely concerned because we felt there was only one place he could be, and that was somewhere deep within the cave. Okay. What had happened was that when Philip ducked under the sump, he'd gone too deep and went 20 feet along an underwater passage that nobody knew was there. Came up, banged my head, and there was no air. It was completely confusing. Help! I had no Help! idea where I was. I was expecting to see all these people, uh, and there was no light. It was completely pitch black. Uh, it was so black, you, you can't describe that, that feeling. Help! I sort of reached round with my hands. I could feel an air pocket. So uh, I pulled myself through in. There was no point in continuing shouting. I was wasting my air. I decided not to try and make the move to go back where I'd come from. 
because I really just didn't know where exactly I had come from. And something we, we had been taught by the Scouts is to stay where you are. Obviously, I realised I was in an enclosed air pocket and I'd only got so much air. But moving from that point and going to try and sort of find my way out again, uh, I mean, I believe, and I believe that this now, that if I'd actually done that, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be here now. Any joy? Nothing. In spite of a thorough search, Derbyshire Cave Rescue couldn't find any sign of Philip. So if he's in there, he's underwater. It's the divers, isn't it? That's right. I'd better give him a ring then. OK. Many things pass through your head at that sort of time. You think about your family. You think about your friends. You know, you just hope that you're going to get out. We've really got enough folk to make a move now. This is the cave. That's where you come in from the surface. Yeah. By the time that I'm called out, the assumption is that it may be somewhere in the water. So, I mean, it's the call we, we often dread, because usually that means um, recovering a body. Apart from that, we know nothing. Hmm? So it's all going to be searched. OK. OK. Mm. Right. All my lights on? Yeah, check away, OK, Jeff. Yep. OK, then. I'll uh, see you later. OK. It was three o'clock in the morning when Alan and his two divers, Chris and Jeff, began their underwater search. But by now, Philip had been missing for six hours and he'd used up nearly all the air in the cave. I was at the point where there wasn't much time left. Being deprived of oxygen like that, your brain starts to be affected. It became like a bit of a haze, really. I wasn't sure whether I was in consciousness or out of consciousness. We begin to question whether he was actually in the place because we'd, we'd searched the obvious places. But then there was one final corner to check where there's a blank wall. I literally fell through a slot, sort of letterbox shaped hole, into a, a passage which was full of water. It was quite possible that this is where he would be. There's a slot here. Right. We need a line reel. Yeah. Okay. They'd used up more than half their air supply, and they'd been on the point of giving up, but they'd suddenly found a new place to search. I groped my way along. I was on the floor in the mud most of the time, and I felt my way along until I, I sort of came to a dead end after what I guessed to be about 30 feet. I turned round them and started coming back. It seemed hopeless, but Chris had no idea how close he was to where Philip was trapped. I was a little apprehensive, and um, I was breathing, I think, quite heavily. Um, so, because I was breathing so heavily, I started floating up. I have an image of a light coming out of the water. That was one of the most sort of reassuring and wonderful sights. I, could, I can't describe it to you in words, really. I took my demand valve out of my mouth to speak to him. <laughs> and there was no air in the air bell at all. I purged as much air out of the demand valve as I dare. His lips were purple. His breathing was just desperate, absolutely desperate. And, and I thought he had minutes to live, you know, minutes to live. And the only thing we could do for him was to get him air as quickly as possible. Found he was alive! A whole range of things shot through our minds then because, you know, how could he have been alive um, after so many hours and in what was a flooded passage? And as the air was foul in the bell, the immediate consideration was to get air into the boy to keep him conscious. They released the last of their air into the cave, but there wasn't enough to keep them alive for long. They'd have to take an enormous chance pulling Philip back down the narrow passage on the end of a rope. It would be very difficult to explain this, perhaps in a coroner's court the next day, why we, we did this. But really, there wasn't much choice. Chris, see that? It's gonna go, all right? Okay. Right, look, I'm gonna put this mask on you now. But after seven hours alone, Philip was right, too scared worry. to go back calm underwater. Down, down. It's all right, look. When one of the divers turned to me and said, if you want to see your mum and your dad again, you're going to have to do this, 
that was when I changed my mind and decided that, yes, I'm going to have to go under the water again. Hold it up, right? Breathe now, breathe. It was a very sort of hard hitting yeah. comment. That's great. But that was what was required at the time. Mm. Okay, they're coming. We just got pulled through in one enormous heap, which probably only took a few seconds, but we got absolutely banged all over the place. We arrived back at the surface and everything was roses. Get your mask off. Get your mask off. Are you all right? Are you okay? You're all right. Ah, come on, Bonnie. Hold on a minute. See you later, Come on, let's get It was such a relief to me. I just hugged him and gave him a kiss, you know, before he before he went. I can't possibly put it into words how much uh, I feel so indebted and grateful to them. I mean, if you ask them, they tell you it's just more than a day's work. But uh, for me, it's something I can't... I'll never be able to pay back. It was so special because against all the odds, this boy survived. I mean, against all of the rules. And that was, that was absolutely magic. Jeff Crossley and Chris Rhodes both received Royal Humane Society awards for their part in the rescue. Philip was taken off to hospital and treated for hypothermia. It's worth realising how easily any of us could suffer from hypothermia or exposure, as it's sometimes called, in an emergency outdoors.